At this point, I want to welcome uh, Daniel Coit, uh, SSO President-Elect, to the stage. That's probably the last time Jeff and I are ever going to be friends, but <laughs> I thought I'd have you all witness it. Um, so first of all, we'd like to express our appreciation to Celgene and Pfizer for providing support of the, uh, uh, in unrestricted educational grants for the symposium. How's <sighs> that working? There we are. Well, you get my whole talk here. Okay, so it is. It is a uh, tremendous honor uh, to uh, introduce uh, Jeff Drebin as he's about to give the uh, presidential lecture. Jeff and I didn't know each other all that well a year ago, uh, but we've gotten to know each other fairly well over the last year. And boy, I tell you, this is one extraordinary human being. I'm going to dedicate my introduction to Jeff's parents, his mom, and his deceased father, uh, without whom we never would have known this extraordinary person. Um, Jeff uh, started life in 1957 and by all accounts had a very, uh, very happy childhood. He had a doting and loving mother, uh, <clears throat> grew up with that sort of infectious enthusiasm that we've all come to know until he got to first grade <clears throat> and then the trouble started or at least we got a sense for what lay ahead. Uh, this is his first uh, grade report card from early in the year from the Walker School, and uh, if you can read it, that column on the right there is all of the unsatisfactories. Uh, he had trouble, he, did, he didn't really play well with others, he didn't respect the property of others, he, he uh, really thought, he doesn't really, didn't really think for himself, he didn't accept responsibility, and he's not, he wasn't very courteous. Um, the comments of the teacher uh, uh, could hardly be contained by the box. Jeffrey speaks con out constantly and always has personal comments to make without taking turns. He tends to copy. He rarely carries out his responsibilities. So uh, this is a pretty inauspicious beginning for somebody who is uh, subsequently to become president of the SSO. His work is usually messy. Uh, he doesn't use his time and materials well, et cetera. Now, I'm going to fast forward because I've been given only a short period of time to talk. Jeff actually fancies himself as quite an athlete until he isn't. <laughs> um, Jeff, at one point during high school and college, had an interest in rugby. And his mother tells me that on more than one occasion, uh, he was seen in the emergency room to rule out a concussion. It's really scary to think how good he would have been without all of this head trauma. Um, his life changed forever when he met the love of his life uh, as a resident at Hopkins. Uh, and here, Linda, who was, a, I believe, a medical student at the time, uh, here they are getting married. Uh, and this, uh, this has been really a constant theme uh, throughout Jeff's life. Uh, and it has lasted uh, un until the present. And I think both of them, each of them, found a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow as they're sitting here on the beach uh, his life changed again forever in 1993 uh, with the birth of his first daughter, Kate, uh, who I think is, I recognize here, um, and, and, uh, uh, and then changed again uh, with the birth of his twins uh, six years later. And you can see Kate here welcoming the two of them into the family. You will never see a picture of Jeff happier than when he is with his children, not, not once. The, the joy, the unrequited joy that Jeff shows when he's with his, with his kids, uh, whether it's here on the lawn, uh, whether it's uh, out skiing or during a holiday picture, is uh, it, he just radiates the joy that families bring to us all. Jeff has effectively climbed every academic summit that he has attempted. Uh, he uh, graduated with high honors, Phi Beta Kappa from Oberlin, uh, MD, PhD, AOA, and Magna Cum Laude from Harvard Medical School. 
He then went on to uh, residency and, and subsequent fellowship training in surgical oncology at Hopkins, was recruited by Sam Wells to the Department of Surgery at Wash U, uh, and finally <laughs> recruited to his current uh, resting place as, as the chief of the GI section in uh, 04, and five years later as, uh, as one of the very best chairmen of, departments of that very illustrious Department of Surgery. I'm going to go through some of his accomplishments. You can't possibly do this in less than an hour. He's going to talk to you a little bit about his formative years <clears throat> when he was getting his PhD and really set into motion or was a part of the cutting edge of targeted therapy for cancer. Uh, <clears throat> this has led more recently to his uh, status as co-PI of a, of a funded and then refunded Stand Up to Cancer uh, dream team uh, in pancreas cancer. He, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine a couple of years ago, one of, I think, only six or seven SSO presidents who holds that, uh, holds that honor. He's been president of the Society of Clinical Surgery and the oldest surgical society in America, the Philadelphia Academy of Surgery, and, of course, currently in his role as president of the SSO. <clears throat> Enough about the paperwork. Jeff is kind of a natty dresser, always really takes pride in his, his appearance, as you can tell, and this goes back some time. One of the things he really takes pride in are his shoes. Uh, and this is a picture of the inner sanctum, sanctorum of the Drebin household, and you can see that Jeff really takes shoes seriously. Now, those shoes all look kind of ordinary, except when you put them next to regular people's shoes. And this is Jeff and I at a Korean dinner uh, 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 recently, and I, I would challenge you to guess which ones are his. My job, Jeff had to carry Weigel's bag, my job was to keep Jeff's shoes shined. And it was a big job, but I think we, we got it done. The other thing, uh, that for a big man, uh, Jeff has remarkable manual dexter dexterity. Now that's his hand right there. And we'll hope this works. I'm gonna fix this <laughs> <Whoa>! <laughs> There was a reward for doing that correctly, and you can imagine what that was. <clears throat> Jeff, when he's not uh, consumed with personal health issues, is a consummate ambassador, international ambassador for the SSO. Here he is uh, at that dinner uh, after that uh, exercise you just saw. Uh, here he is singing karaoke uh, and actually playing some Springsteen, I think, at the time. So he was, uh, he was the life of the party and an enormously popular international ambassador. What do his friends and colleagues say about him? Well, uh, the good things are pretty easy. Uh, and I had a lot of trouble finding anybody who could have anything bad to say about him. Um, I'll just let you read them. Uh, but I think there are, some, uh, <laughs> there are some very personal comments there, Jeff, and you'll know pretty much who many of them came from. But there is some room for improvement. Um, he needs, uh, and these are quotes, uh, needs time to daydream. He doesn't have enough hobbies. You can tell which one of your relatives worries about you in that regard. Uh, he loves food. You can see that's listed on both the attributes and the needs work column. Uh, and uh, he says yes too easily. Uh, and he's not mindful of personal health. And I want to just spend just a minute on that last thing. I'll come back to this first grade report card. Even at the age of six, uh, he was not practicing good health habits. So this, uh, Linda, is nothing new, goes back to uh, the years. We uh, had the opportunity to go down to Cancun, Mexico, and Jeff was feeling a little uncomfortable, so he went to see the local pharmacist asking for some medicine. And the pharmacist says, I can give it to you, of course, but if I were you, I wouldn't take anything without the advice of a doctor. Those abdominal pains could be appendicitis. Uh, Jeff ignored that and went to Wisconsin where he saw another doctor who said all your moaning and groaning merely stems from an acute appendicitis with a few other complications. Hardly the thing requiring immediate hospitalization. And in fact, that did not happen. Jeff got on a plane just before he boarded. He was told that his blood cultures were positive for multiple gram negative and anaerobes. And when he got back to Penn, he was found to have an acute retrocecal appendicitis with a few other complications. Um, fortunately, after a prolonged period of antibiotics during which he missed the opportunity to be an international ambassador, uh, this resolved and he went on to have this taken care of. 
And this is Linda introducing her husband, saying Jeffrey is an appendicitis survivor as well. <laughs> um, this was much to the delight of his trainees. These, this is Jeff with his last four graduated classes who absolutely worship the ground this man walks on. You cannot get any of them to say anything other than laudatory about this man. Jeff Drebin is a dutiful son, a loving husband, and an incredibly, an incredibly happy father. As you're about to see, he is a gifted surgeon scientist. He's an educator, a mentor, and a role model for uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of trainees. He's both a leader and a collaborator. Um, as you could see from his early years, he's, an, he's a very thoughtful innovator. And I think one of them, arguably one of the most extraordinary figures in American surgery today. Um, this is the problem. That's me <laughs> standing in those shoes. These are really big shoes. It is with great pleasure uh, that I have an opportunity to introduce to you your president, Mr. Jeffrey Drevin. Thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, you know, it, the light probably doesn't show me blushing, but that was certainly a remarkable introduction. And, you know, uh, there's a saying that behind every successful uh, man is an astonished woman. And I'm sure my wife uh, would fulfill that as she sees much more than just my messy closet uh, filled with shoes that I don't wear. It's my, it's my great pleasure um, to be here and to address you on the role of translational cancer research and, and uh, the role of surgeons in translational cancer research. Um, I ha do have some disclosures. I do have some past uh, patent royalties. Um, and I'm going to start by acknowledging some individuals who've gotten me uh, uh, where I am and then talk a little bit about translational research with the HER2 new gene as a paradigm and then finish talking about big team science and the stand up to cancer work that I've played a role in leading with hopefully some examples for our next generation of surgical oncologists. I want to start by acknowledging my family. It's my great pleasure to have uh, my wife Linda, my daughter Kate, uh, my other two kids, uh, Harrison and Elizabeth, are home. They're high school students and couldn't be here, but I'm sure on electronic media they'll be able to see this uh, fairly shortly. And as Dan remarked, um, they're certainly my greatest source of happiness. I have to acknowledge great colleagues. From the time I was a resident through my first uh, faculty position at Washington University and now at Penn, I have terrific colleagues and have benefited in so many ways uh, and can't name them all, but want to thank them all here. And I'd also like to thank the residents and laboratory fellows. I always joke that the residents' function is to teach the faculty member, and certainly our residents and, and uh, fellows have done a great job of that over the year. Again, many of uh, the former trainees are here in the audience, or some of them, and, and it's a great pleasure to see them and see their careers progressing. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, some individuals who were very important in my uh, early, early life. Uh, only probably some of the oldest members of the society recognize Ed Scanlon. Uh, I grew up in Evanston. My father was the CFO at Evanston Hospital, and uh, Ed Scanlon took care of a number of my family members. He was really the first role model of what a surgical oncologist could be. Uh, he had a young associate uh, when he was sort of taking care of my mom and my grandparents, a uh, young uh, developing uh, surgeon who, uh, of course, was Dave Winchester, who himself went on to be president of the SSO, and uh, I've had the great pl uh, privilege to work with Dave on a number of things over the years. When I went to medical school, I did my PhD with Mark Green and Bob Weinberg. I'm going to talk about them a little more later, but I wanted to acknowledge Dick Wilson from the Brigham. Uh, when I went to medical school, I had no intention of being a surgeon, and when I came out of my PhD time to be a clinician, I again was thinking I would be an oncologist, but I w not a surgical oncologist. And It was really my time with Dick Wilson that inspired me to pursue that pathway. I went to Hopkins where uh, I was very fortunate to train with John Cameron, and while at Hopkins I met uh, SSO past president John Niederhuber and had the chance to work in his lab, and John's been a continuous source of mentorship and inspiration throughout my career. My first job was with uh, past president, SSO past president Sam Wells, and when he left to go to the American College of Surgeons, he was replaced by another SSO past president, Tim Eberlein, both of whom uh, have made major impacts on my careers, and I was fortunate to work in Steve Strasberg's division, and I learned a great deal of surgery from Steve, even though I thought I was well trained when I got to Wash U. And I think there's a lesson there for all of us that if we're lucky, we keep learning from our colleagues and partners throughout our careers. Larry Kaiser recruited me to Penn in 2004 as vice chair, where my office was down the hall from Doug Fraker. Doug and I were anatomy partners in medical school. Doug's a longtime member and leader in this society, and being down the hall from an old friend 
is really one of the, one of the great uh, sources of happiness in my career. And Arthur Rubenstein, the dean at Penn, appointed me chair in 2009. I want to acknowledge our current and past leadership. I've had the opportunity to serve on the executive committee under the uh, past president shown here. Um, and in particular, I want to give a shout out to Ron Weigel. In the current format of the way the um, SSO works, the uh, president-elect and the president are very uh, closely uh, linked in weekly conference calls with our administrative team and traveling to some sites. And it was a great pleasure to work with Ron. And similarly, Dan, who uh, gave me such a glowing introduction, and I've gotten to uh, be on the uh, phone a great deal uh, and to uh, travel to Korea and, and also participate in leading the society. And of course, our, our future uh, leaders, Kelly, Armando, and Dave, uh, I know will, will do a great job. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our administrative team. Five years ago, we took the risk of going independent, and Eileen Widmer has assembled a spectacular team. I'd like everybody to join me in just thanking our administrative staff for really helping, helping the organization be what it, it is. And, and finally, to thank Richard Schulich and the program committee once again for putting together such a spectacular meeting. Now, one of the questions, I'm going to get to the meat of the talk now, and one of the questions that comes up from time to time is, why should surgeons perform research at all? And, um, you know, it's been said that surgeons that perform laboratory research are like talking dogs. They need not do it well. It's a wonder that they can do it at all. And I, I actually um, find that, uh, don't, find, don't embrace that view, but I have heard it. And it's important to recognize most of us are in, many of us are in academic centers and our clinical activities, while a source of revenue to the medical school, don't necessarily impress the academic community. And so uh, performing research is one of our missions. But I think there's a more important re reason we should do research. And it's shown here in this quote from Judah Folkman, the great uh, uh, father of the study of angiogenesis. And that says, as long as there's an unconquered disease, an injury that cannot be repaired, or a method of prevention that remains beyond reach, we have an obligation to conduct research. Research represents hope, and for many patients and family, hope is the best thing we have to offer. We pursue investigations so that one day we can offer health. Now, we heard yesterday um, some spectacular work on uh, targeted therapies. This is a little schematic showing a, a very simplified view of what we now understand about cancer biology. And as I encourage continuous uh, involvement of surgical oncologists in translational research, this can seem a daunting task. Uh, but it's important to recognize that although there are many, many genes involved in cancer, many of them have similar functions. And in this uh, little schematic produced by uh, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, um, you can see that there are really a handful of different events that occur in cancer, from uh, resisting apoptotic death, uh, activating invasion and metastasis, and some more recent ones, such as avoiding immune destruction and tumor-promoting inflammation that we heard about from Steve Rosenberg. Uh, and, and it's really just this handful of things that, that are the critical events in cancer. And if we can figure out how to block those events, we can, as we're beginning to hear, imp impact and ideally uh, cure cancer. Those who were at the new members' lunch yesterday heard past president uh, Ron Weigel make a, a remarkable statement which is that uh, uh, cancer will be cured in the lifetimes of our young new members. And as my uh, grandmother used to say, Ron, from your lips to God's ears. Um, I'm going to go back now uh, and talk a little bit about her 2 new because I had the chance to be involved in uh, the evolution of this area of targeted therapy. And I want to take you back to 1980 when gene cloning was just a few years old and DNA sequencing was just a few years old and would take weeks and weeks. Um, there was a very limited un understanding of what cancer was about. We knew it had something to do with DNA because there were abnormal chromosomes in many cancers. We knew that DNA damaging compounds that were mutagens could cause cancer. And we knew there were inherited syndromes, so it must have been linked in some way to DNA. And just a few years, sorry, just a few years prior to that, uh, the discovery had been made that some RNA tumor viruses had transduced pieces of cellular DNA and that that played some role in their ability to cause tumors. Um, and just at the time that I uh, went into the laboratory, uh, Bob Weinberg's lab reported that he could transfer the neoplastic phenotype, the aspects of cancer in vitro, using raw DNA taken from tumors. Um, and I had the great opportunity then to work with Mark Green, who's a tumor immunologist, and Bob Weinberg on my PhD work. This shows um, the DNA transfection, again, to show how primitive we were back then. You'd take a tumor line, you'd grow it up, you'd make DNA, you'd precipitate it with some calcium phosphate, and put it on 
non-transformed immortalized mouse fibroblasts as shown over here. And if, uh, there, if you were lucky and you hadn't broken the DNA up too much and if uh, conditions were just right, you would grow out these foci of tr cells that would pile up and uh, behave abnormally in tissue culture. And if you implanted those in a mouse, they would grow as cancer. And so this was a way we could begin to say what's in the DNA that's causing cancer. And my specific project was asking, is there something in the DNA linked to uh, tumor antigens, either due to effects on transcription or even possibly encoding a cell surface tumor antigen? And I was lucky enough to uh, be involved in the first description of the gene we now call HER2 nu. Uh, and uh, my project specifically was making the monoclonal antibodies, which bound HER2 nu on the surface of cells. These are kind of old pictures. I have a high resolution electron micrograph here for those who um, want to see it in more detail. You can see the antibodies binding HER2 nu on the surface of the cell. And after we made the antibodies, uh, the first thing uh, Bob Weinberg, I remember asking me, what do you want to do with those now? And I said, I want to see what they do to the behavior of the cell and see if we can treat tumors. And so we looked at first some uh, in vitro studies. Cancer cells will grow in soft agar, that is in the absence of anchorage, and form these colonies, whereas non-transformed cells, in this case an NIH3T3 line, just form these little punctate clusters. And if one took these cells and put a monoclonal antibody to the HER2 nu protein into the tissue culture, the cells grew like non-cancerous cells, not like cancer cells. We then took that into a mouse model where, again, we'd implant HER2 nu transformed cells into a nude mouse. And if you treated with a monoclonal antibody, the tumor would be inhibited in its growth. And that was in 1986. We then took um, our, a panel of antibodies. I won't go through some of the science here, but essentially, as shown in this cartoon, we had made antibodies to multiple regions of the protein, and we looked at whether a combination of antibodies would work better than a single antibody. And as shown down here, if we took the uh, uh, combination treatment, we could actually get cures in a substantial fraction of animals, whereas single antibodies would inhibit tumor growth but not be curative. So that was, that was kind of as far as we got, and I went off to do my surgical residency. But just as I was writing my thesis, Dennis Slayman and Bill McGuire published this paper that showed that the HER2 new gene, which at the time we thought was sort of an interesting model in a rat system, um, was involved in human breast cancer. And that overexpression and amplification of HER2 new was associated with a bad outcome, initially in patients with node positive breast cancer, we now know in all patients with breast cancer. And it's really critical to recognize Dennis Slayman and uh, Axel Ulrich, who is with Genentech, get a lot of credit for this paper. But Bill McGuire, who had the tissue and had the clinical database and outcomes data on the patients, was absolutely critical. This study couldn't have been done just with people who can do molecular biology. Uh, you needed someone who actually had patient information. We now know that HER2 news overexpressed in cancers of the breast, stomach, less often in the colon, lung, and ovary, as well as the pancreas. It plays a role in transducing signals from the EGF receptor and other ERB family members. And in virtually every tumor in which overexpression has been studied, it's associated with aggressive biology and chemo resistance. Now, we had made our monoclonal antibodies to the rat form of HER2 nu. Genentech, about five years later, made a monoclonal antibody, which is called trastuzumab or Herceptin, which binds uh, human P185 on the surface of breast cancer and other cancer cells. They went on uh, to do a study, and it's very interesting. Um, this is now a tremendously successful pharmaceutical product. At the time, the uh, Genentech board almost voted not to continue development because the first studies showed essentially no activity as a single agent, modest activity with chemotherapy. You can see here the extension of the survival curves is only a few months. And actually, Jose Baselga and I were talking yesterday about how, you know, where would the world have been had we ignored uh, this, this product and its um, subsequent lessons for targeted therapy. But it was approved and subsequently shown to not only work uh, in uh, metastatic disease, but also in adjuvant treatment. And then um, about 20 years after we demonstrated that two antibodies were better than one, Genentech did a trial of a second antibody called pertuzumab and looked at whether uh, that would be better than simply treating with a single antibody plus chemotherapy. And you can see the so-called Cleopatra trial. There was about a six-month extension of, of survival. The long-term survival was also impacted favorably. And that led to the approval of a second antibody and to the standard now of treating advanced metastatic breast cancer with two antibodies plus chemotherapy. And I want to um, point out in this long story that Genentech uh, developed these drugs completely independent of me. 
They spent billions of dollars on clinical trials, and I'm not trying to in any way take um, credit for the development of these compounds as clinical agents. Um, but I am sort of like this beaver who's talking to the rabbit here in the foreground, standing in front of the Hoover Dam, and the caption says, I didn't actually build it, but it was based on my idea. <laughs> now, now, some lessons can be learned about, about how long it took, because when this was started, the whole idea of targeted therapy, sorry, of targeted therapy was, was not um, something that we just take for granted as we do now. So we first made monoclonal antibodies in 84. They made them about five years later, later at Genentech. We had evidence of, of anti-tumor activity in 86. They did the clinical trials about uh, uh, 10 years later that led to the approval of the drug in advanced disease. The synergy of multiple antibodies was shown in 88, and the uh, two-antibody phase two trial was started 20 years later. So again, um, long time from bench to bedside. And if that was the way it always went with targeted therapies, um, we would be in a bad, a bad place. I'm happy to say the timeline from bench to bedside has accelerated. As the pharmaceutical companies have recognized that targeted approaches are often useful, um, we now have examples like this. And I think many in the audience are familiar with the fact that about half of melanomas have a mutation at the uh, V600 position. Um, which activates the kinase uh, in the RAF molecule with resulting downstream signaling through the MEK kinase pathway. And in 2008, an inhibitor that would inhibit RAF kinase in tissue culture uh, and, and preclinical models was described. And two years later, rather than 20 years later, this paper appeared uh, with Keith Flaherty, uh, who was then at the University of Pennsylvania, as the senior author, showing that an inhibitor of mutated RAF had remarkable, if unfortunately temporary, activity in patients with advanced metastatic melanoma. So the timeline has gotten much shorter. And I think part of our excitement with Dr. Baselga's talk yesterday was the recognition that we're now testing and developing compounds much more quickly. Now, I was fortunate to <coughs> be recruited to my first uh, academic position by past president Sam Wells. And Sam sat me down early in my time at Wash U and said, focus your laboratory activities on your clinical specialty. And I, I haven't always done that, but, but I, I'm doing it now. I did it uh, early in between. I did, had grants in cancer, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, did some reasonable work. But if you can do this, if you can take your clinical work and link it to your investigative work, it does give you that opportunity to really drive translational efforts. And so I think uh, Sam gave me good advice. I'm passing it on again to the young people in the audience. And my clinical interest is pancreas cancer. Pancreas cancer is now the third most common cause of cancer death in the United States. Just a few months ago, it passed breast cancer as a cause of cancer death in this country. Uh, it's still on the rise because the incidence goes up with age. And as our population goes uh, up in age, uh, the incidence of pancreas cancer goes up. And therefore, the overall prevalence of pancreatic cancer goes up. And it's important to recognize we cure very few patients. The incidence is almost equal to the mortality. And the reason is that about 80 to 90 percent of patients are unresectable at diagnosis. They have metastatic disease or locally advanced disease. But of those we resect, the survival has traditionally been below 20 percent. Uh, many of them recur. Some of them are unresectable at surgical exploration. So the number who are long-term survivors is quite low. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy are still of very modest benefit. And uh, for patients with metastatic disease, the median survival is still under a year. Now, surgery has gotten much better. This is a paper that Chuck Vollmer at our institution uh, published summarizing a, a big set of pancreas cancer patients all resected in the 21st century. And what you can see is um, that the surgical 30-day mortality is about 0.7 percent, the 90-day mortality less than 2 percent. So we can do operations on the pancreas much more safely. And quite honestly, although I think we'll continue to improve that, Ultimately, minimally invasive uh, surgery may continue to improve the morbidity of surgery, though I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, I don't think we're going to improve the mortality much beyond where we are. And what's really concerning is, although we do the operations more safely, the patients aren't living all that much better in the long run. And this shows data from the first 220 or so patients that I resected at Penn. These are actual survival curves, not Kaplan-Meier. And this shows the Overall survival is about 24% at five years, uh, which isn't very good, although for pancreas cancer, that's about as good as you're going to find. Um, but what's even more disturbing is that of those who were margin positive and node positive, the worst subset, microscopic positive margin, positive lymph nodes, 
the survival is 10 percent, so not that much worse than those who had a more favorable tumor. And of those with the most favorable tumors, those who are margin negative and node negative, the survival is a shade under 40 percent. And I should emphasize, virtually 90 percent of our patients now get adjuvant therapy. So with combination therapy, good safe surgery, we're still not curing very many patients. And the reason is that the biology trumps good surgery. And if we're going to go after the biology, we have to do research. So as shown here, the surgical outcomes are continuing to improve, uh, but I think we're going to get smaller and smaller incremental benefit. We've gotten pretty good already. But cancer biology and translational research is needed to define new approaches to diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. And big scientific teams in multiple disciplines working together uh, are really the key, in my opinion, to designing and, and performing innovative clinical and correlative scientific studies. And the message I'm here to give you is surgeons can and should lead these efforts. Now, I've been very fortunate to be associated for the last uh, eight years or so with Stand Up to Cancer organization. This is a Hollywood organization led by a bunch of very high-level uh, producers, directors, uh, I believe Katie Couric is one of the founders, but it all started because one of the members, Laura Ziskind, who was the executive producer of the Spider-Man series, uh, Mission Impossible, developed breast cancer, and she and her friends felt that the progress in research uh, for breast cancer was just too slow. And so Stand Up to Cancer was founded with a goal of putting together big teams of surgeons, medical oncologists, pathologists, scientists, to do rapid translational research and clinical trials to advance cancer treatment. Now they called these dream teams. Um, this is the original dream team, the 1992 Olympic team that had uh, Michael Jordan and Magic and Larry Bird. Um, but, but the Stand Up to Cancer dream teams are multi-institutional consortia in multiple specialties. They initially funded five in 2009, one of which was our award. And they've done a total of 19 now. And one of the things they focus on is rapid timelines. And the other thing they look at is doing a good basic science and translational correlative work. Now, in 2013, um, at our leadership, there's an annual leadership meeting, uh, a, a writer um, named uh, Bill uh, Saparito came and interviewed a number of us. I was a little embarrassed by the, the cover because it, how to cure cancer, I'm not sure we're there, but I think this is moving us in the right direction. Uh, but the great thing about this article, in addition to the fact that um, my family was impressed that I was in Time Magazine, my mother more than my children, who had never heard of Time Magazine before, um, <laughs> was that I was the centerfold. And this is a photo of me doing a Whipple on a patient enrolled in our clinical trial. Those are my hands in his open abdomen. And I think it's fair to say this is the uh, only time in my life I'm going to be a centerfold. So um, this was a, was a source of uh, career satisfaction. But the, the project um, was a big project. I was one of the co-PIs with Craig Thompson, now at Memorial, and Dan Von Hoff at TGen. I'm not going to talk. There were uh, seven clinical trials, $22 million. We're the only group Stand Up to Cancer gave additional money. After our first $18 million was up, they gave us another four to extend some of the trials. And it's important to recognize within six years, as I'm going to tell you, we were able to turn around a second-generation trial, and we're about to start a third-generation trial. So the goal of nimbleness that Stand Up to Cancer set for its investigators, I think, has been uh, held up. And the, the project I've led is called the Protocol to Permit the Acquisition of Samples of Tumor and Normal Tissue for Biological Endpoints in Pancreas Cancer. We thought if the title was that long, perhaps the IRB wouldn't pay too much attention to what was actually in the, the uh, clinical trial proposal. Uh, but the, this was basically a project that, again, involved numerous individuals at Penn, at TGen, at great scientists at Princeton and at the Salk Institute, as well as at uh, Johns Hopkins. And one of the lessons that, that I've um, taken throughout my career is on this little plaque. This was on my dad's shelf in his office. It says, there's no limit to the good a man can do if he doesn't care who gets the credit. Now, um, my dad didn't make that up. It turns out this was in Ronald Reagan's office, and Ronald Reagan didn't make it up either. It, um, the best I can do is say that a 19th century Jesuit priest named Father Strickland actually wrote something like this, but it's certainly been adopted widely. And I think it's really important, if you're going to work in a big team, Everybody can't be the first author all the time. You have to work together looking at the ultimate success of the team uh, as your goal. The other thing is you have to do uh, and keep track of your clinical data. And this shows the 109 patients that we enrolled in this trial over a period of about uh, two and a half or three years. And the uh, overall survival, again, you can see that the curve is flat in the first 30 days. There were no early mortalities. And overall, our survival appears to be as good or perhaps even better, probably due to better adjuvant therapy these days than in our 
uh, work I showed you that was uh, from 10 years earlier. And the project involved taking blood in the operating room after a patient was asleep and then doing surgery and running the specimen to surgical pathology and browbeating the pathologist to get the tumor and get a piece of normal tissue. And it, we kept track of all sorts of things like the ischemic time in the operating room. And the biggest source of delay was getting the pathologist to move along. But eventually they recognized that this crazed surgeon was going to nag them until they did it. And they moved pretty quick. And we would snap freeze some of the tumor and ship it off to our colleagues at other institutions. Part of it we would put into tissue culture and send to Peter O'Dwyer's lab, which would then grow out stellate cells and send them to Salk Institute. We'd also draw a Buffy coat to have normal genomic DNA. I'm going to tell you about the different uh, projects briefly. The DNA analysis was led by Victor Velkulescu from Johns Hopkins and Mike Barrett at TGen. We published this last summer in Nature Communications. This was one of the biggest series of completely sequenced resected pancreas cancers. Interestingly, when we started this in 2009, we thought we were being so daring to try to sequence 100 specimens. Now, of course, as you heard from Jose Baselga, it's standard to sequence. Uh, I should point out that the cost has gone down at least tenfold to, uh, from 10,000 per specimen to uh, somewhere less than $1,000. Now, the first thing we learned from this is that targetable mutations are common in pancreas cancer. There is, as Jose told us yesterday, there's no dominant uh, one. But if you look here across these different genes, and I'll call out ERB-B2, which is the same gene we call her 2 nu her 2 nu in three patients out of 100 was amplified on a chromosome just like it is in 20% of breast cancer patients. And probably those three patients would benefit from anti her 2 nu therapy. But again, it's a minority. You're never going to find those if you just test those targeted agents on a big pool. Uh, so you really do have to do these uh, things that they're now doing with the basket trial uh, to start looking at individual patient responses uh, based on personalized sequenced uh, tumors. The other thing we learned was very interesting. And this shows multiple, each vertical line represents a single specimen. And you can see that the, the genes that we thought should be abnormal in pancreas cancer, for example, KRAS is mutant in about 88% of specimens, uh, P53 in 77%, SMAD4 about 30%. So these are genes we know this uh, was reassuring but not surprising. But what was interesting was there was a family of genes that are, play a role in chromatin remodeling. And they're in the family called MLL. They were first described in leukemia. Uh, they're 1, 2, and 3. And there's another family member called ARID1A. And when we look, you'll notice, for one thing, that these don't happen in the same tumors. They seem to happen in one or the other, but not both. And that suggests that perhaps they're doing a complementary function. And when we broke out the MLL mutation and looked at how they did clinically, as shown here, versus those who had RAS mutations, lots of others, but were wild type for that MLL family, the curves were dramatically divergent. The p-value for this involves lots and lots of zeros. And similarly, if we put the ARID1A group in a, a similar sort of curve, so we have a group of patients that have a predicted survival, about 20% of them, um, that is well out beyond four years, and another group that has a median survival of about 12 months. And so uh, molecular pathology and molecular stratification of risk. I would argue these patients are being well served by surgery followed by adjuvant therapy. I think for this group of patients, maybe we need to think about doing something different. Now, the next project involved metabolomic profiling. And this was led by Josh Rabinowitz, who's an MD, PhD, but a full-time uh, biochemistry professor at Princeton. And Josh runs a lab that can do remarkable analysis of specimens. We would get these tumors out, snap, freeze them, send them off by FedEx. The first few we actually drove up personally, but we figured out that FedEx worked just fine. Um, and he would then run them through a mass spec and generate a heat map. And as shown here, a blue is down, yellow is up. He could measure in, in this, I think it's more now, but at the time he was measuring 266 metabolites simultaneously. So all the amino acids, all the nucleotides, a variety of other sugars and and other compounds. And when he did this, um, he, we found out immediately, and we, in all cases, compared normal pancreas from the same patient to the pancreas cancer, just grossly cutting out the tumor. There were reproducible abnormalities. That is, certain amino acids were down, certain amino acids were up. And probably one of the most interesting things, which we're just following up now, there was a sugar that had never been described in human beings. It was des described in other mammalian species, but never in humans that was markedly elevated in pancreas cancer compared to normal, um, as shown here. And so we do have serum on these patients. We're now asking, could this be a useful biomarker? 
Um, but the other thing, Josh is a very smart guy. He took a look at this. He said, so why are the non-essentials down, the essentials up? Usually growth is limited by essentials. They're usually near the normal sort of baseline, and these ones should be accumulating. But if pancreas cancers were chewing up whole proteins, like albumin, breaking them down into amino acids, using the non-essentials for other functions like nucleotide synthesis, the essentials would accumulate beyond what was needed for protein synthesis, and this profile is what you would see. Now, the kicker was it had never been shown that it was possible for mammalian cells, human cells, to ingest whole proteins. And so that led us to collaborate with Daphna Barsaghi's lab at NYU in studying, uh, she was working with RAS transformed 3T3 cells and observed a process called macropenocytosis. This is a very uh, evolutionarily old way that sort of uh, slime molds and bacteria, other things can engulf whatever's in the neighborhood and then digest it. It's sort of like what macrophages do. And, and you can see here in this um, cartoon that um, if one looks in this case at a RAS transformed cell line, they engulf these rhodamine, the fluorescence are little rhodamine particles that are in the media whereas a wild-type RAS pancreas cancer doesn't. Um, and if one uses an inhibitor of macropenocytosis, something called ethyl isopropylamylaride, they no longer, this cell can no longer ingest these pieces. You can look at the, what that does to the growth of cells. This shows a RAS mutant cell with limiting glutamine. One can add albumin and the cells will grow as shown by the uh, increase in density in these microwells much better, so they can use albumin as a growth source, something never before understood. And again, if you use this compound, you could block that and the cells wouldn't grow as well. That's just shown schematically here. And that led to sort of a preclinical trial in which they took KRAS mutant xenografts and showed that if you treated the mice with ethyl isopropylamylaride, not a compound ready for clinical trials, but maybe as a base to be developed, that the tumor in growth was inhibited that you were blocking the ability of KRAS mutant human pancreas cancer cells to take in nutrition and inhibiting growth. And that's shown in this waterfall plot. BXPC3 is a KRAS wild type pan human pancreas cancer cell. There's no effect of this uh, drug. Whereas in the KRAS mutant cells, there is a fairly marked inhibition of growth and even regression in some animals. So again, a new way to target KRAS mutant cells by targeting the way that the cells get nutrition and blocking their metabolism. The other thing is that there is an albumin nanoparticle formulation of uh, paclitaxel called abraxane, and we've uh, recently used that drug as a radiation sensitizer. There's not much data on this, but we, we have a phase one, two trial in which we took locally advanced patients. I think you can see here there's tumor sitting on the celiac, kind of a big bulky tumor. The patient got uh, two months of chemo chemotherapy with gemabraxane and then radiation with continuous abraxane infusion it was well tolerated, and the responses we've seen in the first phase of this trial, and it's small, are very, very surprising. I mean, the tumor really shrank. It shrank away from the celiac. We've been able to resect five of the first seven patients. These weren't patients with borderline resectable. These were locally advanced tumors. So we're hopeful that this will be an advance, again, with now an understanding of the potential mechanism that pancreas cancers suck up albumin, and they'll suck up albumin-coated nanoparticles that have chemotherapy, sort of a Trojan horse approach, if you will. And I'm going to finish talking about our work on stellate cells. Now, um, this was published uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago in Cell. Uh, it was led by Mara Sherman, who's a postdoc at the Salk, and Ron Evans, uh, one of the great uh, nuclear receptor biologists and the discovery of the vitamin D receptor. And although at first gl glimpse we may think of a tumor as just a bag of cancer cells, we have to recognize tumors are tissues. They're tissues with blood vessels, with lymphocytes, and with fibroblasts. And these cancer-associated fibroblasts in the pancreas are called stellate cells because they have a particular morphology. And stellate cells secrete a variety of cytokines and other substances which stimulate cancer growth, block the immune system, uh, and generally uh, facilitate uh, the, the process of, of pancreas cancer evolution. Similarly, the cancer sim uh, releases factors that stimulate the growth of these uh, fibroblasts or stellate cells, and that's the reason we see such a dense stroma around our pancreas uh, cancers when we look at them under the microscope. And one of the things Ron did when we started sending him stellate cells was notice that the pancreatic stellate cells were highly enriched for vitamin D receptors, even though the whole pancreas and most pancreas cancers don't have much in the way of vitamin D receptors. So it's, it's present in the stellate cells, but not in the cancer. And so 
It's known that these stellate cells can be quiescent, where they don't make much extracellular matrix, they don't express smooth muscle actin, they don't make these factors that stimulate cancer growth, but they can be activated. Simply putting them on plastic for a while can activate them. And in the presence of cancer, they're frequently wildly active, making large amounts of these factors. Again, a vicious cycle. And what Ron was able to demonstrate was he could cause them to uh, not be eradicated, but to sort of reverse migrate uh, back to a quiescent state by using vitamin D or a very potent vitamin D analog. And this shows some data from about the thir first 35 or 40 specimens we sent of isolated stellate cells from pancreas cancer patients who'd had their tumors resected. In every case, blue is control, pink is calcipatriol. This is a very potent vitamin D analog. Vitamin D catalyzes an enzyme that breaks down vitamin D. So you give vitamin D, it makes the enzyme, breaks it down. You can't get real great responses to vitamin D just by going to GNC, buying a big bottle of vitamin D and taking it. But if you have an analog that's resistant to degradation, you can get potency way beyond what you would see with normal vitamin D. And what you can see here is that for every one of these factors, which includes a variety of extracellular matrix, secreted factors, and pro-inflammatory cytokines, treatment with vitamin D down-regulates the secretion of those things from human pancreas cancer stellate cells. And I'm just going to call your attention to CXCL12, which is a chemokine that inhibits the immune system. It blocks T cells. They're actually small molecule inhibitors uh, being designed in, in studies to see whether that can be useful in patients. This is one of the good things that we think that vitamin D treatment does. Um, and what, what does that mean in vivo? Well, uh, Mara Sherman in Ron's group took this into an animal model using the KPC mouse the KRAS mutant mouse that uh, gets pancreas cancers at a high rate. They took mice that had established tumors, treated them with either gemcitabine or gemcitabine plus vitamin D, and noticed about a five-fold increase in delivery of gemcitabine to the cancer. The tumors grew more slowly. They showed more apoptosis and less metastasis. And perhaps uh, the, the real proof in any animal model is there was a significant extension of survival for treating with chemotherapy plus vitamin D. Now, what do we do with that? And this is where, again, the stand-up to cancer people said, great, you need more money, you can do a trial, we'll give it to you. And so we opened this trial at Penn, um, which was to take patients and in the fa first phase, randomize them to one uh, cycle, one month of continuous paracalcitol plus gemabraxane, followed by surgery and then another three cycles of the treatment. All of them got paracalcitol post-op. We randomized in the first phase so we could study whether the paracalcitol was really impacting the tumors. And uh, this was a small uh, phase one trial, uh, but again, the rationale was the fact that we had this in vivo data, we had this great human um, in vitro data. We couldn't use calcipatriol, which was the one that had been used in Ron's lab because it's actually not approved for uh, systemic administration in people. But there's another drug called paracalcitol, which shares the same resistance to degradation by uh, the enzyme that breaks down vitamin D and has been used in, in uh, treating a variety of disorders, renal failure, uh, fibrosis, uh, some cancer trials. And so we used that. And so um, we wanted to ask whether that would have any harmful effects, whether it would deliver uh, the signaling that we expected on the tumor and uh, that we could validate that it was doing what it, uh, we expected it to do. This was, a, not a neo, this was not a trial for locally advanced disease. These had to be resectable patients. They got a single cycle with or without uh, paracalcitol and then surgery with tissue sent for all the same things I just showed you, uh, followed by three more cycles. Now we found really very modest toxicity. The gemcitabine uh, abraxane does have expected toxicity, but it's pretty well tolerated. There was no interference with planned surgery or increase in post-op complications. And one patient at the very end of four months of massive dose vitamin D therapy uh, developed, uh, it's interesting because we measured calciums every week, normal, normal, normal for three and a half months. and then all of a sudden from 9.8 to 10.5 to 11.3 with hematuria, and she had developed a kidney stone. But other than that one patient who at the end of a long cycle of therapy, no one else showed any effects. And one of the things we were very gratified to see was when we looked at what happened in the tumors versus uh, the patients who hadn't received paracalcitol, the genes that went up and down were exactly what we saw in tissue culture. That is, we were hitting the target. And I'll call your attention again to CXCL12. So in the tumor, it, when it's not treated with paracalcitol, you have a certain level, it gets knocked down if you treat with that vitamin D analog plus chemo. CYP24A1 is that enzyme that breaks down vitamin D. It's induced by vitamin D, and you can see that it goes up. So with the dosing we were using, we weren't having toxicity, we were hitting the target, and we had a surprising immunologic finding. 
when we brought the first specimens up and showed them to the pathologist, they said, boy, there's a lot of lymphocytes in these specimens. And as uh, those who study tumor immunology in the pancreas know, if one looks at non-tumor versus tumor, there's a dramatically reduced amount of T cells in the tumors. And we think this is related to the stroma as uh, acting as a physical barrier, but also potentially the release of chemokines like CXL12. And when we treated these patients, we dramatically increased CD3 infiltration as shown in these stains. Those cells were also CD8 positive. This is a graph uh, Bob Vonderheide had done some studies on untreated patients. Again, benign normal tissue versus cancer from the same patient in a variety of untreated patients, very few CD8 cells. Those who received the neoadjuvant treatment, much higher level of CD8 cells. So again, what's the next step? Now we've done two cycles. We've gone from bedside to bench, back to bedside, back to bench, and we just received uh, an award. Uh, Stand Up to Cancer did have something to do with it, but it includes funding from the National Science Foundation, National Cancer Institute, the V Foundation. Uh, I'm happy to serve as PI, but it includes uh, great investigators from Memorial as well as Mass General. And what we're going to do now is take that gemabraxane vitamin D protocol and add a checkpoint inhibitor and see if we can activate T cells in those tumors. Uh, there's extensive correlative science. This project is supported by the NSF because we have some world-class physicists who are doing mo theoretical modeling and T cell uh, studies. So I think it's a very exciting project. So in summary, advances in cancer biology have driven translational research and then the timeline from bench to bedside has become much shorter. Translational studies require access to patients, tissue, and data on clinical outcomes, and that's something that we have. Team science is really the future, I think, for these complex studies uh, because no one individual can do all these different uh, great aspects of science. But I hope I've convinced you that surgeons can lead these studies, and I hope these studies will eventually take us uh, towards the vision that uh, Dr. Weigel expressed yesterday of curing cancer uh, in some of our lifetimes. So again, um, this has been really uh, the high point of my career to serve as president of this organization. It's been my great honor, and I thank you all for the opportunity. <laughs>